the riff, the droning riff you were doing? At the intro? Ago? That was, yeah. yeah, the intro to Warped. You want? Yeah, I'd like to see you kind of break that apart a little bit. Okay. That one is, uh, I'm using some effects on that. I don't know if you got camera angle to do this, but I'm stepping on a, a Boss Digital Delay and a Boss Super Chorus. I find that the uh, individual pedals are a little bit more accessible for me. And uh, I'm, I'm droning the E string, the low E. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving it open completely. And I'm doing most of my movement on the A string, starting at the octave of the low E. Mm -hmm. And kind of getting a little rhythm happening here. And I found that I can basically move myself anywhere on the neck on that A string and have it work. Even if I go to the wrong note, if I go there by accident, I can make that work by putting more feeling into it and possibly repeating it. Um, one of the things that I found about accidents and mistakes is that if you go to the wrong note, play it a couple times and it sounds like you meant to do that. <laughs> so if I, this, if this note, for instance, was the wrong one, And that way, I just repeat it and make it sound more dissident. Yeah, and you made it work that time. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah so that's how the song Warped starts out, with that little riff. And uh, at a certain point, we all come crashing in like uh, banshees. <laughs> are, you, are you thinking melody when you come up with something like that? Or is it really um, <sighs> experimental? Where am I now? I'm going to make this work now. And I'm not necessarily thinking about melody per se. I'm thinking of a specific framework that I want to stay in, which is the droning, uh, kind of repetitive, dissident sound. But in terms of what I play, I pretty much focus on how it is I feel. So I might get more dissident if I feel a little bit more up in the head. But um, if I'm feeling non-creative and you know really uninteresting, I might play something that's just, um, I don't know, mediocre. I suppose, but it, the whole the whole point I'm trying to make is that it's more of an improvisation mm -hmm. rather than like a specific part. I see, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but I, I like to put those two effects on because it creates a more spacey dimension, and when the uh, the rest of the band comes crashing in, it's even more drastic of a change rather than like being completely clean. <laughs> Because when the band comes in, you when go the band comes in, I play that riff. So it's and which I'll focus on that in a second. But the point I'm making is that with the spaciness, it, um, you know, starting off with the song, when the band comes in, it's more of an attack, a drastic change, mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of, the effect, the desired effect, was to have it like make your heart skip a beat a little bit the first time you heard it. But now that riff, if you're interested, yeah. is a uh, dirty sound. I'm all the way up on the guitar, and uh, it's very simple. It's just this low E and the octave on the A string that we talked about earlier. Like a little modulation on that A string. And I'm muting a little bit mm -hmm. with this hand, but right. not not too much, not like a... Because that would be too much. It's just kind of got to be a subtle resting on the bridge here. So I don't get that extra ringing that muddies things up, which would be... Because then there would be no... Um, you wouldn't hear the notes right. entirely well. You mentioned several times that octaves. It right. seems to be a, a part of your style. Yeah, it's a saving grace, if you will. There are two types of octaves that I, I utilize in my playing. One would be simply finding a scale that I'm staying in for soloing, mm -hmm. which would normally for me, it's this scale. What is that called, do you know? Uh, the minor pentatonic scale. When I'm, when I'm in the minor pentatonic scale, um, I usually don't stray too much from it, primarily because when I was learning how to play guitar, that's the only scale I was right. actually taught. Seems to be the first one we're all taught. We're all taught that one, and there's there's so many different places you can go in that scale. But for instance, if I'm playing this one, I'm in the A. Mm -hmm. I find myself in the, in uh, the key of A. 
um, sometimes to kick into a different gear when I'm soloing, I will simply go an octave higher up here in that same scale. And uh, sometimes, you know, you get yourself, you're, you're soloing and you get a little bit lost and you want to kick into another flavor. What I do is I just go either all the way up or all the way down an octave and creates the illusion of changing gears, such as in a situation, uh, excuse me. By the way, get yourself a guitar tech who will not allow this to happen. This <laughs> is the sticky wah-wah pedal uh, circumstance. That's Mr. Dave Lee over there. He's responsible for this pedal not working. We'll see him in a moment. Um, anyway, like I was saying... What I'm doing there... Excuse me. Ah, thanks, Dave. Uh, is is basically playing what I know out of that scale and moving it up an octave. Um, and, and like I said, that's good for shifting gears. The other um, types of octaves that I like to use a lot is where I'm playing two notes at the same time mm -hmm. on the neck, which is, I guess, another Hendrix-esque thing that I've stolen, which is found in the song Third Stone from the Sun, I believe, where it's... Right. And what that is, it's... Um, I guess you're using two strings and kind of muting the one in the middle there, not playing it. But sometimes if you play it, it's good too. <laughs> so it really depends on what you want to get. But usually, I'm not playing the middle string, and I, which is a nice thing for soloing um, when you're playing. <laughs> And uh, I've also been known to use that as um, parts, rhythm parts, for songs. Whereas um, in Warped, which we were talking about, um, the song that goes, there's a, the the chorus in that song goes. It's almost like half solo, half rhythm. Yeah, and and, uh, and and the two notes really fatten it up a little bit, yeah. you know, and and it, it creates another flavor. The song that we have called "Shallow Be Thy Game" would be kind of a mock Hendrix ripoff type of a thing, where it's it's a lot of the uh, excuse me, it's a lot of the that that E nine is that what it's called E nine mm -hmm. that um, Hendrix, I guess, in my mind, is famous for using a lot of and uh, you know I just basically took a riff around that chord which is all in E which is and uh, yeah like that great so your start your starting point sort of is like you said, the E9 at the 7th fret? That's what it's all revolving around, but um, the start of the riff is just a, is a bend off on the, I guess, the low E string. Mm -hmm. I was always confused. Is this the low E string? Because it's higher. It's higher, yeah. It's higher on the neck. Hold the so, guitar the other way. Yeah. So Easy. I see what you're saying. <laughs> okay, so on the low E string, it was just a little pull off there. Back to that E. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like um, yeah, straight across the straight across the twelfth fret. It's not really a bar. It's not really a full bar. It's more focusing on the um, those three strings there. I don't know what that would be. Is that the second string, second, third, and fourth? <laughs> yeah, we'll say one, two, three, four, five, six today. Okay, so that's that's what that is. <laughs> And a lot of the muted strings right. in between. You know, kind of that voodoo child vibe thing. Yeah, it's so much more interesting just instead of just hanging out on that E9, or right. like what a lot of other players right. might do. And, um, you know, I had to think more in terms of what Flea was playing, you know, which I wanted to leave some space because he's such a fascinating and rhythmic bass player mm -hmm. that, you know, everything he does deserves to have its place, and I would hate to come and piss all over his bass lines. <laughs>
But I was initially, like I said, I was initially interested in playing the guitar because of Jimi Hendrix. I was at a skate park and I was doing some skateboarding and I looked up and the PA was playing some Jimi Hendrix and I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. I guess the, the way to be to remain fluid on the instrument is just by simply playing it. But um, I don't necessarily strive to sit for hours and get better and faster and, and be stronger so much as I as I today I look more within myself to see how I'm feeling, to see what it is I'm trying to accomplish on the guitar. But I, I wouldn't have gotten to that point if I hadn't practiced tons when I was a yeah. child. Virtually had no friends. <laughs> There's a song that we cover called Red Hot Mama. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a Parliament Funkadelic tune. And the riff is... Even with the muting, still. And sometimes when we're getting a little bit aggressive, I'll pop on that octave pedal. It's just a cool sounding thing, and uh, I use it in a guitar solo for the song Shallow Be Thy Game. Um, and it just kind of adds like a, a thick ugliness that I really enjoy. And uh, in the solo, it, it sounds something like this. <laughs> Ugly. That's the desired effect of that one, you know. Um, so, for instance, in Tearjerker, the intro of Tearjerker, I have a digital delay on for my 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 guitar sound. You can hear the repeats there, and I go with another digital delay delay that sits right next to it with the setting on the hold. So, what I'll do is I'll play a note and then hit the hold button. Oh. You hear that? Yeah going forever if I want. And then my guitar has the other delay on it. I don't know if this is making sense. It's two delays. And anyway... And at this point, the other one is... its only function is holding that note. One delay is only holding this note over and over again. Right. And the other delay is on the guitar. And, to play now. and then I play over it. play the, the bulk of the song on top of it.
I'm not necessarily trying to teach you to play that song, but you know, it's it's a it's a, a neat effect, you know, to have to be able to play with yourself, so to speak. Was that a, a, something you found by accident one day, or? Um, I guess so. Most of the stuff that I like to do, I found by accident. You know, yeah. uh, it comes from mistakes. It comes from sitting around at home and being a little bit bored of just what the guitar and the amp does and trying to tweak knobs and trying to come up with a cool sound and yeah, I guess it, you could say it was by mistake. On uh, a certain part of that song you just played, um, mm -hmm. I think it was a B minor maybe? Right, you were doing some, you lifted your fingers off and created something. Yeah, um, that's something I like to do when I'm playing with chords, especially in the clean sound. Um, I keep my hands in the same position. For instance, are you familiar with the song Airplane? Oh, sure. Okay. One of my favorites. So the intro of that song is, I guess, a C bar chord, right? Is that the C, car the C bar? There you go. <laughs> okay, that's the C. <laughs> I'm not like a technical guy, so you have to bear with me. Um, and I start with the suspension. What, what I think you were talking about is, is the movement within the chord right. itself. Uh, you know, the suspension is obviously the addition of the pinky on the, uh, the second string here. Mm -hmm. uh, but more so, more importantly than that, I experiment as I'm playing. Sometimes I'll, I'll lift the whole, the whole uh, I guess, what is the, whole, the part of the chord. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll lift off and have it open and then just experiment around in there. So you're almost keeping the foundation of the chord in place. Exactly. And playing sort of scale ideas around it. Yeah, it's either it's more scaly. You're not thinking and it's, scale. You're just it's pick, it's and picking and scales and um, you know just different. It's a different way to play the chord and and like for instance in the beginning of airplane. Usually when we play it live, I play it differently. You know, and there's subtle differences every time I play it yeah. because I'm just always. You just play a little, just play a little bit of it. The beginning of it, of airplane. is the next section change that you threw off here. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's similar to what we discussed in Warped, where it's an intro that's primarily unrelated with the remainder of the song, and uh, it, it you know it lays a nice groundwork so that the bulk of the song can kick in, right. and uh, I guess it almost sounds more exciting than if it wasn't there because there's something to compare it to. Could you uh, show a riff where you actually have to play? Like a funky chord thing, and then go into a single note line. Sure, um, I, I do it more in uh, in like rhythmic senses rather than soloing senses because uh, mm -hmm. even though I can play a note like that, I, I find that I don't feel good about it when I'm doing it. You know, so I don't really play solos that way. But there's a song called Coffee Shop mm -hmm. where uh, I kind of incorporate that picking style in the rhythm which uh, goes like this. And what that is, is I'm playing these two strings of, of the E, the uh, mm -hmm. just the kind of the root of it, and uh, keeping that going the whole time. Muting, muting uh, the E down here, so just get the stabs. So when you don't hear those strings, I'm muting them. Uh, when I go to the G, which is the change in that one, instead of going, I kind of hammer on from the E string to the G. And 
that's what the bass is doing, and sometimes I, I double it, which is a simple pull off on the D string, a, a hammer on on the A string, and then open D, G on the E string. This is a guitar which um, I'm the first to admit is probably one of the hideous, most hideous guitars I've ever seen. However, it sounds beautiful. Not when you do that, but when you, when you play it, it sounds nice. It sparkles, man. Yeah, it's got a nice little sparkle to it, like you say. And there's a song we have called My Friends. Yep. And uh, it was recorded on an acoustic guitar, and I used this song, this uh, this guitar rather, live to mimic an acoustic guitar. is live. It just, it's kind of nice. It's kind of a, a nice combination between an acoustic sounding guitar and an electric guitar. I don't need the plug for this. This is the guitar that I played in the studio uh, for the solo of Walkabout. Mm. Walkabout is a, a funky little number that uh, the rhythm is with the wah-wah pedal. And uh, for the guitar solo, I wanted something really ugly sounding, and, and uh, you know, we were talking about clean and dirty right. effects and sounds earlier. Um, well, this guitar isn't intended for studio record recording, <laughs> I don't think. You know, although it does have a jack, what I did is cranked it up all the way. I had a mic right here in this little speaker. There's a speaker built inside the guitar, and uh, it just sounds kind of bad. <laughs> But bad in a good way. And I think um, what I did that day is I turned it on and I left it leaning up against the wall for about an hour and a half so the batteries were kind of going <laughs> and it made it sound even crustier and, and, and more, um, more ugly. <laughs> this, I, I played this guitar for the majority of uh, the Jane's Addiction years. And um, it's got a great, it's just got a really great sound to it. It's really thick and really crunchy. It's a little bit too heavy sometimes, so I only use it on particular songs. Songs like um, One Big Mob, for instance, where I really want just like that. <laughs> chunky yeah it's very chunky sounding and uh, for some of the funkier songs I don't I, I don't go with it just because it's it's almost too much guitar but uh, what I do like about this is that it's got many different sounds to it and uh, you know I think that's important to select a guitar that you can get a rainbow of sound out of so with all the effects we were talking about, how do you, I mean, do you have to actually push each one off and uh, go to the next one? Do you have a special pedal board? I do have that? a pedal board. I have uh, a slew of uh, different effects here, different pedals, and I have my wah-wah pedal on this board, and I also have uh, my channel shifting from clean to dirty built into this board. <laughs> I also have a little uh, tuner there, and uh, that's basically all I need for a live uh, setting. And what kind of amps do you use? 
right behind us here, we have the JCM 900 uh, series made by Marshall. And what I like about these amps is that they have uh, <coughs> a dirty channel and a clean channel built into them, um, which just by the flick of a, of a foot switch can have one or the other. Um, I think that I actually run two heads, is that correct, Dave? I go through two heads, and I think one head controls the upper two cabinets, and the other head controls the, the bottom two. Mm -hmm. And it has something to do with the low end. Dave, what does it have to do with? Well, Mr. Navarro, the way we've got it set up is we've got one head running the top cabinets and one head running the bottom cabinets with the signal split to go to each head. So therefore, we can control the actual volume and tone of the top and bottom rather than side by side so that we can control through the stage resonance more so and the cabinets pointing at your face instead of being separated side by side. Yeah, so I have, I have the low end coming through the bottom and I have the not so low ending sounding uh, guitars coming through the top. I guess nowadays you could say this is a simple setup but you sort of get full sonic spectrum. Yeah, I, I like to have it uh, so everything's like out on the floor and, and accessible you know, because a lot of times I'll go down to the actual pedal and manipulate it during performance. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, such as this uh, this delay that I was showing you guys earlier with the hold button on it. I can set that to infinite repeats like that. It just continually goes. And uh, I can move the time so it goes faster or slower. And it's just kind of a cool sound. <laughs> <laughs> kind of unearthly, and you know, there's really no technical aspect to that. It's just, it is what it is, and, and you'll get actually get on the floor and do that. I'll get on the floor and do that, you know, and uh, right. I actually utilize that at the end of the song "Copy Shop." There's a delay pedal manipulation thing happening there. Do you have a uh, certain regimen for songwriting or a process to go through? Um, Songwriting is something that there's really no one way to do it for me. Um, I know some, some songwriters that have formulas and, and um, specific approaches, but um, what we do as a band is was we focus a lot on the jamming aspect and uh, just being fluid with one another and playing a lot together. And um, song ideas will come out of moments, little pieces of, of jam sessions that we'll have. Other song ideas will come out of a guitar riff. Other song ideas will come out of a bass riff. And uh, in one instance, uh, there's a song called Evil that actually didn't appear on our record um, that came from a drum pattern that Chad was playing. Mm. Um, and in fact, the breakdown section in One Big Mob came from a drum pattern that Chad was playing. Uh, and other songs come from even vocal ideas that Anthony comes up with. And I think that that's important to be open to any influence when it comes to songwriting because that way you cover a much broader spectrum. So Dave, in closing, have anything you want to say to your hungry fans and newcomers? Uh, I would just say to stay true to yourself as an artist and as a musician and um, play what you feel, you know? If you feel angry, play something angry. And if you, pl if you feel uh, a little sad, a little melancholy, play something that reflects that. Um, I would, I would suggest that you don't try and focus on what people are doing around you and, and try and emulate that. Um, but be aware of what's going on around you and if you can, lift ideas and, and uh, create your own through those ideas. And I, I would say spend a lot of time on your instrument, you know, would be the main thing. Um, and uh, I've said it before and I will say it again, instructional home video is not the way to go. But I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for letting us come down today. Appreciate it.